appreciate that, Scott. That wasn't near as, nearly as painful as I thought it would be. He had me worried, though. I'm glad to be here. I'm at, uh, some of the things I've been through, I'm glad to be anywhere, but I'm glad to see you all. Uh, you know, serious students of the Bible, and even a few skeptics recognize that Jesus is the greatest teacher of all time. And when he concluded his masterpiece, we call the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And on another occasion, the teaching of Jesus drew the reaction that in a very simple yet profound statement that never a man spake like this. And, and we, we, that begs the question then, what was it about his teaching that was so enigmatic, that drew such attention? Was it his doctrine? Yes. Was it his delivery? Yes, again. His preaching and his presentation were such that Jesus was either adored or despised, but seldom ignored. And as I have this assignment, I, I wish to, uh, before we get into it too far, I do wish to thank the elders here in the school, uh, especially for Andy and for the hard work he does for his uh, his friendship through the years, his, his stalwart dedication to the gospel of Christ. I thank you all for taking time, making plans to be here when there are so many other things that you could be doing. And it's an encouragement, not only to me, but to the students and to the school that you all have chosen to be here. I appreciate it very much. Our text says in Luke 18, beginning in verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes unto heaven, but said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that exalteth himself, or the he that humbleth himself, shall be exalted. So one of the things about the teaching of Christ was the methods he used. Common sense, every day. He simply put the hay down where the calves could get it, then the cattle could get it too. So he spoke a parable, verse 9. Now, I don't know if anybody has defined a parable or described a parable yet uh, this week. I'm, probably they have, but I'm going to do it again. The word parable is a word that was actually brought over from the Greek language. They substituted English letters, basically, for the Greek letters. And it's a compound form of two words, para and balain, which means, uh, para means beside, balain means to throw. So biblically, it literally suggests the throwing or the placing of one, si uh, one thing beside something else for the purpose of making a comparison. And the, the Greek word parabole is used about 50 times in the New Testament. Once or twice it's translated figure. Another time or two it's translated comparison. But most of the time they anglicize it in its parable. And the people that described in parables are actual uh, real people. In other words, uh, in contrast to a fable, where uh, the characters in a fable are sometimes given supernatural abilities or qualities or characteristics, uh, a parable differs in the fact that the, the, the people described in a parable are just people. They can't do anything that people couldn't ordinarily do. Um, they were real life situations that 
imparted to us moral truths. I've heard it said that parables were uh, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning, and I suppose that's just as accurate as, as anything else. But it's often been said that the parables of Jesus differed from the illustrations that a lot of preachers use today. Sometimes a preacher will have a point, and then he'll use an illustration to drive the point home. Whereas the parables that Jesus used were themselves the teaching. They didn't merely illustrate another point that he was trying to make. They were the lesson. And that's where they differ a lot from the illustrations that, that we as preachers try to use today. Another thing about the parables that Jesus used was, or the, about parables in general, that the fact that Jesus used parables was a fulfillment of prophecy. In Matthew uh, chapter 13, the, uh, the, psalm, the psalmist, and it's accredited to Asaph, uh, back in Psalm 78, where it said, He will speak to them in parables. So what was the purpose, and why would parables be used? Well, one thing, parables were used to make spiritual truths clear and, and, and easily attainable to the ones who were sincerely seeking the Word of God. You know, it, it's not hard if, if somebody is open-minded and they have a fundamental uh, belief in the Bible, in God, you can show them something from the Bible and they will believe it. We experienced that in Kenya. Uh, the people who were, they didn't have all this baggage that we have in America and we could present the simple facts of the gospel and they would say, oh, well, if that's what the Bible says, that's what we'll do. So the parables were used to make the spiritual truth plainer to the sincere seekers. Now at other times, parables were used in a fashion to conceal the truth from the enemies or from the dishonest who would desire to use the teaching against Christ or his disciples. Um, Matthew 13, uh, 13 through 15 is an example. Also, and this one is, is one that's uh, touches me, I guess, in a personal sense, because my dad had a way of doing this. <laughs> These parables, or sometimes parables, were used as a technique to cause men to grasp a certain truth before they even realized they were being taught a lesson. My dad had a way of doing that. Of course, by the time I was 12 or 13, I was so much smarter than my dad. <laughs> And uh, you all know, you, you've been there, you know this. But by the time I was 18 or 19, Dad got pretty smart again. And probably the one example, or the, the, the best example of this, of, of, of a parable being used to teach somebody without them really realizing they were being taught is the example of Nathan and David. David had, in a sense, stolen Uriah's wife and committed that awful sin with her. And Nathan comes to David and says, David, let me tell you a story about this, uh, this poor man. He had one little ewe lamb. And he worked for a rich man who had all kinds of flocks. Well, one day the rich man had a guest come. And instead of taking one of his abundance, he took this man's one little ewe lamb and, and, and uh, dressed it and, uh, for the guest. And David said, well, that, that's not right. That makes me mad. Surely this man shall die. And Nathan said, thou art the man. And David said, wow. I mean, Nathan taught David a lesson before David even realized he was being taught. And finally, parables are used to help men in, uh, remember the teaching. We remember the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. We remember these, the parable of the, the, the seed and the sower. They help us remember these truths. They help us remember these things. So no wonder that Jesus is called the master teacher because of this style and this method he had of teaching.
So let's look at a few perspectives relevant to this parable in verse 9 again. He spoke this parable, the text says, to some who trusted in themselves. Now, he does not tell us who these self-trusting ones are. He does not specify by name or theology. And this has led people to wonder just exactly who is Christ speaking to. Now, if this is a this narrative is a continuation of the discussion which began in the previous chapter, we know then that there are some Pharisees present. Was Jesus is telling this? Um, they they come to him in chapter seventeen, verse twenty, and say, when, "When you know, when's the kingdom going to come?" So we know there are Pharisees there, and we know that some of his disciples were there because in verse twenty-two, uh, he spoke to them, as well as in verse thirty-seven, they ask him, you know, a question: "Where, Lord?" And it would seem unlikely that a Pharisee would call Jesus Lord. Some say the Pharisees are the obvious choice uh, for, the, for the, the direct audience. They certainly trusted in themselves. They trusted in themselves to the point that they certainly wouldn't take advice from a lowly Nazarene, would they? Others say that Jesus was referring to some of his followers who felt perhaps they had an inside track to righteousness because they're following Jesus and becoming a little headstrong and complacent. Uh, the master is going to use this as a, way, as a means of kind of reining them in a little bit, holding them down just a little bit. And the point is made that if Jesus were charging the Pharisee with such dreadful conduct, that his point might be missed on the masses because the Pharisee was behaving just like one might expect him to behave. But on the other hand, if they could understand that he was teaching them, that is a disciple who has uh, making some little progress, and now he's in danger of falling back into the Pharisaic sins, if they realized that Christ was teaching them, they would just need to be aware of their sin and perhaps they would repent. Whoever these people were, I think likely he's talking about the Pharisees. And it's one of the few times, I guess, that he actually used uh, the Pharisee in a parable to teach a Pharisee. <laughs> that, that has caused other people to think, well, he's not really teaching the Pharisees here. He's talking to talk to his disciples. I don't know. But the lesson will be plain. So these folks, whoever they are, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Now, to be righteous is neither a feeling or a perception, despite what society tells us. A lot of people can feel righteous. A lot of people can perceive themselves or others as being righteous. But whether or not one is righteous and is not based on my feeling or my perception or your feelings or your perception, it's based on whether or not we are walking in harmony with the will of God. That is what makes us righteous and not uh, public opinion or the pollsters. These folks did not turn to the Father for uh, righteous approval, but to themselves. And that's where we get into trouble. Pharisees certainly wore a cloak of righteousness. For Christ said, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 and verse 20. So they trusted in themselves that they were wise. And secondly, we find in verse 9 that they despised others. To despise means to hold of no account. It means to consider uh, unworthy, to treat with contempt. Others who were not as externally righteous as ourselves. And this again was the character of the Pharisees. And sadly, it's true of many Christians. They have the attitude that is described in Isaiah 65, Stand by thyself, for I am holier than thou. We'll learn very plainly in a few moments that such an attitude is not only unwise, but it's dangerous. 
In verse 10, we see that, this, that Jesus, as he's telling this parable to these self-righteous ones who trusted in themselves and despised others, he says, there are two men that went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees, which originated probably back after the uh, Jewish uh, exile, they were considered by society as the most religious and the most pious of people. They were very highly educated in the Old Testament scrolls. They added a lot of oral tradition, which they actually held higher than the inspired word. They sought for distinction and praise, and they prided themselves on their good works, much like the Roman church today. They exhibited a strong belief in the existence of good and evil. They awaited the coming of the Messiah, but they stood for everything, it seems, that Christ was against. In Matthew 23, beginning in verse 25, in, in the midst of this scathing rebuke, which none of us would dare do today unless we be crucified in the court of political correctness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind guides, Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but within are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. And the Pharisees jumped up and said, don't judge. <laughs> they didn't, but that's what people would do today. You know, as Andy and I were driving here this morning, we took the back entrance in, and there's a beautiful cemetery that we passed, and there's a, a mausoleum up there. And, you know, you imagine this thing, and it's elaborate, and it's beautifully adorned, and wherein some very, I'm sure, some very prominent loved ones are, uh, were, were laid following their, their passing, their demise. The lawn was kept trimmed. It was free of, uh, free of weeds, and, and the mausoleum looked like it was immaculately cared for. Um, and, and when you see such a beautiful building like that and, and, and the manicured lawn, you almost forget its purpose. But you know what? Inside those graves, inside that mausoleum, are the remains of a person who has passed from this life. And time will take its toll on the organic vestiges that remain. And certainly beauty will be lacking. Such were the Pharisees. Outwardly, they were beautifully righteous and they were mechanically precise, but inside, they were corrupt and rotting. The other was a tax collector. So two men went up to the temple to pray. One was this righteous, self-righteous Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. Now, this may shock you. But the, in, in Bible times, the tax collectors did not garner the respect that our tax collectors do today. And the word literally meant a farmer of the tax. They were, you see, Judea at the time was, was under Roman jurisdiction. And the Romans would hire out Jews to be the collection agency for the Roman Empire. This made these Jewish tax collectors not the most popular people in the region. They were viewed by their fellow Jews as traitors. Because now, Rome didn't care how they got their money, they just wanted their money. <laughs> And the Jew would extort. He would charge more many times than what was due. And he would give Rome what Rome wanted, and then he could pocket the rest of it himself. The original carpetbaggers, perhaps. 
But they were characterized in, in association with thieves and with adulterers. And you recall how the people reacted when Jesus went to the home of Zacchaeus. He said, why is this man going to be a guest with a man who is a sinner? Didn't describe him by his occupation, but said he's a sinner. And they got on the disciples. Why do you eat with publicans and sinners? So you couldn't hardly think of one without the other. And they each recited a prayer. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, the Bible tells us. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the posture of the Pharisee. Because the Bible says that he stood and prayed thus with himself. And I, maybe I emphasize the word stood to make my own point. But, but standing is a common prayer posture. We know that Solomon stood uh, before the temple of the Lord. It is possible that the Pharisee, however, took a grandiose posture to make, uh, to make himself appear more holy in such a, a wonderful place. It's also possible that men have made way too much out of the posture of the Pharisee because we'll notice a couple of verses later that the tax collector was also standing when he prayed. But the Pharisee starts out in verse 11, God, I thank you. So far, so good. And he would have been vastly better off had he stopped right there. But like so many of us, and yours truly included, he doesn't know when to quit. Will Rogers, there's a quote from Will Rogers that says something to the effect of, never miss a good chance to shut up. I wish he'd had Will Rogers around. He might have been better off. But in reality, what he is about to do, instead of praying to God, this Pharisee is about to congratulate God for having such a wonderful worshiper as himself. God, you don't realize how lucky you are to have me as one of your people. That's the essence of what he's saying. I thank you that I'm not like other men. He glanced at God, but he contemplates himself. And if it were not for his own righteousness, for his own spotless life and perfection, that God himself would be bereft of true worshipers. From here he proceeds to accuse all other men even enumerating their sins for them. You know, uh, there's a song that uh, he may have, may, may have heard, it may not. It's called The Pharisee in Recovery. And uh, the singer says something about, you know, uh, it's the way of my evil way to go around confessing other people's sins, reluctant to admit my part or a deeper problem within. But he's going he's gonna to tell God, you know, I am righteous, God, because all these other men are adulterers and they're extortioners and they're greedy. But, you know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those that commend themselves. For they trusting in themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, it's easy for us to sit in the pew and look at Sister Bertha better than you beside us and say, well, I'm a better Christian than she is, so God will have to accept me. If you want to stack yourself up against somebody, you read the life of Christ and stack yourself up against Him. Maybe that will take some of the wind out of your sails and will help us get back down to earth and get back into the vision, the business of worship and evangelism and not just playing church. So we see in his self-approval, we see some glimpses of some other unsavory characters in the Bible. We see this rich young ruler who says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. Well, I've done that. What lack I yet? Well, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. Oh. And that's what the Bible tells us. He went away sorrowful. He was so gung-ho. He was so zealous 
We see the, uh, you remember the, the, the brother, the older brother in the prodigal son parable? Father, I have served you faithfully all these years. I've, I've been your spotless, perfect, hardworking son. You've never killed a fatted calf for me. We see a glimpse of that. We used to call it in construction, we called it the Me Too rule. If, if the pipe fitters got a special favor, then the iron workers wanted it too. They'd Me Too. And then the millwrights wanted it. And then the electricians had to have it. So it's, you know, if they get it, we want it. And that's kind of what we're getting here. So I thank you, God, that I'm not like these other men, or even as this tax collector. Gets personal. His contempt for this man is heard echoing through the temple complex. And the masses watching this display surely agreed with this Pharisee, though, because he was, well, after all, the most pious of all people. You know, and even if the Jews of this time did not consider this Pharisee to be inordinately boastful or arrogant, it still is in stark contrast to the attitude of Christ and Paul. And therefore, we would do well to emulate the attitude of Christ and Paul rather than this Pharisee. I, and it, I even wonder if the Pharisee was capable at this time of true thankfulness. Because thankfulness implies the acknowledgement of the reception of a gift. Did he really acknowledge the reception of a gift? Or is he acknowledging in his mind the reception of the great gift he is to God? His thanksgiving didn't refer to what he had received. But his thanksgiving referred to the sins of others by which he was separated from them. And from his own righteousness from which he is separated from them. That's what he's thankful for. It, it's kind of a kind of a backhanded appreciation. We're good at that sometimes. Oh, he goes on. He's not done yet. I thank you. I'm not like other men or even this tax collector. Well, you know, God, I fast twice in the week. It's almost like he's dropping names. He's going to pad himself as, as good as he can. You know, Moses' law, if I understand it, required men to fast once a year. But by this time, the historians tell us that the Pharisees were fasting twice a week. So that's about 104 times a year. He's, he's building up a lot of bonus points, isn't he? Surely God sees me as some kind of a super saint. This is a clear example of the gnat straining, camel swallowing that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 23. And I think this is part of the point that my Christ, I know it's part of the point Christ was making in Matthew 7, 21 and following when he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will come and say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in thy name, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus will say, Depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, we did all these, but you didn't do what I said. Brother Rush hit on this point yesterday, and masterfully so, about Martha. Martha, who was worried about all these extra things, and she was ignoring the weightier things, the more important things. You know, school teachers, or even college teachers, sometimes will give bonus questions at the end of a test, maybe mounting to 10 or 15 percentage points. So it's possible that if you ace the test and answer all the bonus questions, well, you can get 115 or 120 points for a test. Okay. Suppose a teacher is offering 15 bonus points for the test, and you decide that you're not going to take the test. You're just going to answer the bonus questions. Guess what? You failed. Because those 15 points aren't going to get you passed. Okay, the Pharisees were good about it. They wouldn't have bonus questions, but they didn't take the test. They didn't do the main part of it. That's the problem. 
He goes on. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now the law of Moses required that you give tithes of your increase, not of your surplus, not of what you had. If you had $10,000 in the bank and the Pharisee made $5,000 this year, well, he was going to tithe $15,000, even though he wasn't required to. All he had to do was the $5,000. But since he was going to be super pious, he's going to do it all. And he wasn't going to be quiet about it either. He was going to write his name on the check in big letters so the church secretary and everybody could read it. <laughs> super saint. You know... Isn't it nice today that we're not limited to 10% in our offering? Some of you are going, uh huh. <laughs> the tax collector, in verse 13, says he was standing afar off. Couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't let himself get near that Pharisee. He is standing afar off, and I imagine as a broken man mourning his sin. Your sin should be mourned. I'm quite convinced that's what Jesus meant in the, prayer, or in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who mourn. That's something we've lost in this country. We don't mourn over our sin. Were the people ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. Jeremiah chapter 8. He was mourning over his sins. Now, this tax collector knew how he was viewed in society. He knew how this Pharisee viewed him. And no doubt he felt inferior to the Pharisee, to the people who might have been there in the temple complex. He did not want to make a spectacle of corruption in such a holy place. He kept his distance. Would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. A guilt-laden heart will do that. A contrite spirit that is fragile and remorseful for sin has a hard time looking up. Do you recall the incident in Luke 22? Right after Peter had denied Christ the third time, the Bible says that while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord looked at Peter. I don't read that passage where it doesn't give me chills. Peter had just denied his Lord for the third time. And the instant, while he was still speaking, he turns and the Lord looks at his face. Can you imagine how Peter felt in his stomach? I think I would have thrown up. To know. But I just said that. And to look in the eyes of Jesus. He beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This was a sign of mourning, a sign of grief. I think perhaps a sign of repentance. His plea, God, be merciful. And you know that word he uses for mercy in this instance is not the common word. We think of, again, the beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But that's not the word that is chosen here. The specific word chosen here in this place comes from the word that is most often translated propitiate. He is praying... Uh, it's the same word the Hebrews writer says that uh, he is our faithful and high priest uh, the, uh, to the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's the word he uses here. He is praying that God would be propitious, that is, willing to cover his sins to forgive him. In our English translations of the Bible, it says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But in the Greek copies that we have, the definite article's there. And it would read literally, God be propitious to me, the sinner. A couple possibilities for that. The sinner could be similar to what uh, Paul was saying in 1 Timothy 1.15, where he said that I was the chief of sinners. There's another possibility, I think. 
since it seems there are two men in the temple praying, and one of them has already presented himself as the righteous one, the only choice is he say, well, be merciful to me, the sinner of the two. Whichever view we hold, I want you to note a couple things. Number one, this tax collector does not claim any special entitlements. He doesn't seek out any worse sinner than himself, you know, to which to draw to attention. He doesn't even point out the arrogance of the Pharisee, which I think he would have been probably justified in doing. But he knows that God knows. He took upon himself the attitude of the prophet. He said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am, uh, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Here is a man who was sin broken, sin sick in his heart, and he's begging for forgiveness. So the pronouncements that Christ make regarding the principles and the prayers, beginning in verse 14, Christ says, I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Justified. Justification in the Bible is a judicial act. God being the judge. It is God that pronounces one righteous and renders us as free from the guilt of punishment. Justification does not make one righteous, but it pronounces one or accounts one as righteous. As members, excuse me, of the Lord's church, we are guilty, but God accounts us as righteous. That is justification. When we use justified to say, well, you know, this guy came home from work every night and beat his wife up because she was lazy and they try to justify his actions. That's not biblical justification. That's just wrong. The justification is when one who is guilty is declared, reckoned, regarded, accounted, accredited, innocent. Technically they're guilty, but they're treated as innocent. That's, that's what we want. <coughs> Jesus said everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. You know, the Proverbs writer said, Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, Come up here, rather than you have to go to a lower place. I can't think, can't help but think of the Bob Euchre commercial where he's sitting in this fancy spot and the, and the ushers come and say, buddy, you got to get out of here. And he says, oh, I must be down in the front row. Well, they end up putting him clear up in the top of the bleacher somewhere. Our Lord taught this truth. Three times in the Sermon on the Mount, he he. He indicates that the self-righteous would claim their rewards on the earth. That ain't, the implication is that there would not be a reward waiting for them beyond this life. Are we not naturally suspicious of those who come to us telling us how good they are? I, I saw it in the music business when I was, in, when I was on the road. We've seen athletes, preachers. If someone is that good, somebody else will be singing their praises. They don't have to sing them themselves. I remember Brother Denver Coopers saying one time that the old preachers used to say, if you, if you toot not your own horn, it won't be tooted. <laughs> By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. And Jesus' own disciples seem slow at grasping this concept at times because a couple of them came to him. One instance even tells us that they got their, they got their mother involved. Grant that these my two sons will be seated on thy right hand and thy left hand when I come in thy kingdom. Jesus said... Paraphrastically, you don't get it, do you? 
And he sets a little child in the midst. He says, unless you humble yourselves as one of these little children, Paul gave us a beautiful example of humility regarding our Lord. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who took upon himself the form of a servant, and being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself, or he humbled himself, and being found in fashion as a man, he, I'm getting this, I'm going to read it, I can't quote it. I've only quoted it a hundred times. Philippians chapter 2. Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's an amazing thing that we contemplate that Christ was for eternity where we want to go. He was already there. Now what kind of humility did that take for Christ to leave heaven and come to this earth? Probably more than I could muster. It is not uncommon for man to have an overestimation of himself. Sometimes when one is serious about commitment, especially to the Lord, zeal can run ahead of intellect. We are taught at an early age to be the winner. Or at least my generation was. Now, today's generation is everyone gets a trophy. But we allow this attitude of I'm got to be the winner to creep into every aspect of our life. And it creeps into our spiritual life as well. Self-promotion prevails. Humility suffers for a time. The brother of our Lord wrote, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. James 4 and verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. You know, I, we moved to Byesville, which is just south of Cambridge, and, and we've got about an acre of ground, and I've got some cherry trees, and I've got some pear trees, I've got some apple trees, and you notice the apple trees last fall, they didn't do worth a nickel this year because of the cicadas, I think, but last year, last year, those apple trees were full, and the limbs that had the most apples on them were bowing closest to the ground. The limbs that bear the most fruit bow closest to the ground. Our prayers should be directed towards God. God does not need us to tell Him how, how we are. God doesn't need me to tell Him how I am. Because the moment I start telling God how good I am, bam! <laughs> Dan talked about somebody bursting into flames yesterday. I'm not going to try to tell God how good I am. God knows how weak I am. God knows how grumpy I am when I wake up in the mornings. God knows how big of a baby I am when I'm sick. So does my wife. I don't need to tell God how I am. He knows me. When I address God in prayer, when we address God in prayer, we should be aware that our sin should cause in us an awareness of our need for God's mercy, our need for God's willingness to cover our sins. A lot of people are religious. The Pharisees were religious. Charles Manson is religious. Jim Jones was religious. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 5.20, I say unto you that unless your righteousness, your religion exceeds the righteousness or the religion of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means 
enter the kingdom of God. And I pray that we will adopt the attitude of this tax collector that we can go down to our houses justified. How do we do that? Justification does not come through mental assent to the Father by asking Jesus Christ to come into our heart and be our personal Savior. We have to hear the gospel. And we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24. We have to be willing to repent of our sins. That is to turn around. Not be sorry we got caught, but be sorry that we sinned. Luke 13, 3 and 5. We have to confess the name of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 10, 32. Not only with our lips, but I think with our life once we become Christians. In order, and we're almost saved, but almost saved is still totally lost. We have to be, we have to have our sins forgiven. We have to have our sins washed away. We have to be saved. That's done in the waters of baptism, according to the commandment of our Lord, the example of Paul and Peter, and every New Testament example of conversion. They all culminate in that final act. You know, you left your house this morning and you got on the road. You were almost, you were coming this direction. You got out here in the parking lot. You were getting closer. But you weren't in the building yet, were you? You're getting closer. And you walked up the sidewalk and you got outside these doors out here. But you weren't in the building yet. You weren't in the building till you crossed the threshold of the doorway. Baptism is the threshold that takes you out of the world and puts you into the church. And that's what it takes. That's the only way God knows to save you today. If you're not a New Testament Christian, we would urge you to take those steps and become a Christian today. If you, have, if you are a Christian but you've been unfaithful or negligent in your duties, we'd encourage you to come back. We would encourage you to put the Lord uh, back in your life. Make Him the Lord of your life again. Would you do that now, please, as we stand and sing?